Welcome. I am joined, I am Bud Friend Jones. I'm one of the ministers of this church. And I am joined by my colleague and our interim senior minister, Doug Watkins. Our hymns today will be led by our accompanist, Don Brin and Doug Watkins and Paul Lewis. Uh, our tech crew, Klaus Obermeit and Doug Caldwell have been here without fail every Sunday since we've been broadcasting these services. Uh, so I welcome you to our worship service. I invite you now to listen to some beautiful music by Rameau uh, as we share with you a few announcements of what's happening in this church. Well, if you didn't gather from the video just now, uh, I'll tell you that our theme for the month of June is playfulness and the importance of play in all of our endeavors. I want to, um, again, welcome you here to the Unitarian Church and to call your attention to our website. If you are a visitor especially, there's a place for visitors to sign in and uh, we'd like you to do that. And leave us your email there so we can uh, inform you of um, the uh, various activities that are coming up and send you the links that you'll need to have to, in order to participate. Um, there's also on the website a donate button and we would encourage you to use that as often <laughs> and as generously as you can. It's not a case of uh, vote as often as you can, but to donate as often as you can, that's fine. Um, as you know, the church uh, does need to um, receive continuing contributions in order to continue its ministry. I have a special announcement to make. On June the 27th, the last Sunday of this month, a special congregational meeting will be held by Zoom to elect members to the Settled Search Committee Settled Ministerial Search Committee, uh, we will be looking for a new senior minister. We are choosing people from our congregation to pursue that search. The exact time of that meeting will be announced in the June 18th contact newsletter. Uh, UUC as members will vote to approve the slate of candidates that are presented. If you want to participate in that and you are a member, uh, th then you will need to receive the Zoom link. So please send an email to the church office and you can um, also request a link to the biographies of each of these candidates in case they are unknown to you. 
And now I'm, I'm really happy to tell you that our musicians today are uh, Kevin Allen on violin and Chad Talman on guitar. They are well known in the local scene, especially for what, um, what they're calling gypsy jazz. This music simply swings, as you will see, and it's full of beauty and romance. They perform in the style of what the French call jazz manouche and le hot jazz, le jazz hot. Uh, from about the 1930 to 1940 40 period. Locally, you can hear them here today, but also at WSLR Fogartyville, The Bay, and especially at State Street every Saturday night from 7 to 10 p.m. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. We look forward to hearing more later in the service. It's time for our chalice lighting. I hope that you will light your candle or your chalice at home as together we uh, honor our principles this morning. This month we are focused on play, and Sabine wrote, Playfulness is really about dancing with the spirit, dancing with ideas, new life, and personal transformation. Above all, playfulness is about love, the grand movement of love in and out of our lives. We light this chalice for the loving and playful spirit of our third principle, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. I invite you to join us in our opening hymn, hymn number 108. My life flows on and in this song. song above earth's lamentation I hear the real though far off hymn that hails a new creation through all the tumult and the strife I hear the music ringing it 
sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? But though the tempest round me roars, I know the truth it liveth. What though the darkness round me close, songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love prevails in heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble as they hear the bells of freedom ringing, when friends rejoice both far and near, how can I keep from singing? Through prison cell and dungeon vile, our thoughts to them are winging. When friends by shame are undefiled, how can I keep from singing? Let us now calm ourselves, gather ourselves into a, a mood of centering, centering in words, centering in silence, centering in song. I will read to you a rather well-known poem by Bill Holm called Advice, August 4th. And that will be followed by a period of silent meditation, followed then by our singing together, Spirit of Life. This is what Bill Holm wrote. Someone dancing inside us learned only a few steps. The do your work in 4-4 four, four time. The what do you expect waltz. He hasn't noticed yet the woman standing away from the lamp. The one with black eyes who knows the rumba and strange steps in jumpy rhythms from the mountains of Bulgaria. If they dance together, something unexpected will happen. If they don't, the next world will be a lot like this one.
In preparation for our sermon this morning, a reading from Playfulness is a Spiritual Practice by Bernard L. DeCoven. Play is a thing of the spirit. Playfulness is a spiritual practice. Toys and games are like prayer wheels, more or less. More like player, player wheels, tools to hold your mind to, to free your soul. Play is without purpose. It is how we engage with our bodies, minds, each other, the world, for the fun in it, the joy of it. Even if we are playing with money, truly playing, it is not so much for the money as it is for the freedom from money, for a connection to community. Even when we are playing to win, the real victory is in being part of or just bearing witness to a moment of shared transcendence. Being playful is what we do to stay in play, stay open, responsive, light, ready to engage or disengage as the moment dictates, like playing with a puppy or a small child. Kind of the reverse of martial art, a peaceful art, the art of peace itself. Playfulness is a practice that shapes our souls. It connects us. It is an act of belief in ourselves, the vehicle whose wheels are powered by our faith in life, bringing us to places of wonder, moments of joy. It is almost the last thing to leave us before we leave altogether forever. Here ends our reading. If we were alive um, here, people in the sanctuary, I'm sure you'd get an ovation for the, for the music. And for all of you out there, State Street, Saturday night, 7 to 10. You can get more. 
So we're going to talk about play. I, I, the powers that be believe that Unitarians maybe need to focus on play and playfulness a bit, or maybe Americans or maybe the world after all that we've been through. I want to begin by just mentioning there are four books in my life that have changed my life profoundly. One was FFC Northrop's The Meeting of East and West. I read all of these when I was young and they just had an impact. One was Walter Kaufman's The Faith of a Heretic. One was Albert Camus' The Plague, sort of the opposite of where we are today, and or maybe in terms of COVID, right where we are today. And one was Johann Heusinger, Homo Ludens. It's about that one that I want to talk to you today. Who was uh, Johann Heusinger? He was an anthropologist, a professor at the University of Leiden. Leiden gave us Rembrandt and Spinoza. Um, he was fluent in many languages, considered one of the founders of modern study of cultures, and he is the first to study playfulness as a cultural phenomenon. Today, play studies is a field of major academic study. While the book he wrote that I want to share with you is somewhat academic, it is eminently readable. And even though it was written in 1937, I think, 38, um, it, is, it is as current uh, as you would want any book to be. Huizinga comes to startling insights in this book, which we're going to explore this morning. And we're only going to take a little nibble of a feast. And I hope it entices you to order that book today. So let's look at some of the characteristics of play that Heusinger identified. <clears throat> play is not ordinary or real. I, we understand that, right, when we're playing. A child um, was pretending, he tells the story, to be the engineer of a train uh, and who guided the train. His grandfather came into the room and saw him, thought it was so endearing, and rushed to hug him and kiss him on the cheek. Don't kiss the train, the kid said. Grandpa, the engines won't believe it's real. Yes, one of the most important characteristics of play is a sense of relief that we have from the burdens of everyday reality and its imaginary but all-consuming reality. Play has to be voluntary. It has to be voluntary or it ceases to be play. Have you ever tried to force a child to play with someone or play a game that it didn't want to play? Have you ever been forced to play something you had no interest in playing at all? Play also has a, its own location. An empty cow pasture may become a field of dreams. But I personally would rather go to Tropicana Stadium, wouldn't you? Or Churchill Downs, or Blues Alley, or London's New Globe Theater, or La Scala, or, or, or. Play um, has its own sense of time. I'm rushing through a really fine book, so I want you to go back and, and savor this. It's, if you go to the theater, it's not 8.30, in the evening, it is the time for the second act. Uh, or the, a baseball game, it might be the fifth inning. Or at a concert, the third movement. Play has its own rules, and it only succeeds when there are such rules. Every game has its own set of rules, be it chess or, or lacrosse. Uh, if people don't obey the rules, the game begins to go sour, doesn't it? Sadly, there are some people who cheat. But even when they are cheating, they are cognizant of the rules and determined to evade them. And in a way, that's a testimony to the effectiveness of the rules, because it would be no fun to cheat if you weren't getting away with anything. Uh, so the spoil sport, on the other hand, is somebody who rejects not only the rules, but the game itself. There are bad players. And that's a major topic of the book. And it is a major topic of our era right now uh, in what we're living through. 
and I don't have time to deal with all of that in this sermon today. I'd love to maybe teach a, a four or six week class on this book. It would be fantastic. One always uh, tries to dress appropriately for the sport du jour. Um, every sport has its own appropriate apparel. I, for example, would not go to a hoedown in uh, a suit and tie, or I wouldn't go to a chess competition in a bathing suit. Maybe you would, but that's not what I would do. Play also creates community. Playing together creates real community. We all have had that experience. Actually, my childhood playmates are still among my best friends. I remember the women of my home church making apple butter, sitting together for hours and hours by a huge cauldron over a hot fire, and having the time of their life. Barn raisings, knitting parties, bowling together, as Robert Putnam said, they all create social capital. They all create community. At this point, Heusinger makes a striking observation or a, 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 a turn. These same characteristics of play we just described uh, can be applied to what we consider culture. And he's the founder of the study, academic study of culture. Stay with me for a moment. Think about your everyday life. You're going to work. You're going to church. You're going to the doctor's office or shopping or the courthouse or so uh, other kinds of activities. In every single case, when you enter into that, play, that reality, uh, it's not ordinary. Work, church, the doctor's office, shopping, the courthouse, you're going to a place that's not ordinary. Its design, its architecture, its staffing, its decorations, they were all created to serve a specific purpose and an extraordinary purpose. They are not where you would normally choose to hang out. They are, for the most part, voluntary. <clears throat> you choose which supermarket to visit and when to go there. You may have received a summons to appear in court, but truth be told, even responding to that is voluntary. Some people choose not to appear with uh, potentially negative consequences. You are also going to a special location uh, you're not likely to attend a prayer meeting in a supermarket. Uh, you won't hear a choral concert or a jazz ensemble um, in a sawmill, though I suppose in America stranger things have happened. Generally, if you're going to the courthouse, you don't expect to also pick up groceries while you're there or get your blood pressure checked, your car fixed, or your child in childcare. Generally, you go to the grocery store for groceries, courthouse for courthouse type things, and so on. Each of these places in our culture also create their own sense of time. We wait for that bell to ring. Oh, yes, for the class to end. Even if we're enjoying it, we look forward to what's next. Uh, we wait for the presentation to be done, or possibly even the sermon. You can argue that our lives have been regulated by clocks since the invent its invention in the 1400s. But actually, through all of human history, we ordered our lives by the rising and the setting of the sun, the phases of the moon, the cow's need to be milked, and a host of other natural stimulators. But within each of the institutions now, there is its own distinct sense of time and times unfolding. The church services of my youth lasted until the minister finished his three-point sermon and we sang all four verses of the last hymn. The doctor's visit lasts until it's over. A jury trial might take hours or days or even months. And rules, oh yes, rules. We hate rules. We complain about rules, but whether they are from our homeowners association or the authorities of the beach 
or in the cabin of an airplane, for example, uh, a recent example, in spite of our many differences, we do appreciate rules. They enable us to live together with some degree of peace. Without rules to guide us, life would be like Times Square on a busy night when the power goes out. On the other hand, even within the game, we often need to adjust or negotiate the rules. And clothing, even clothing. We generally dress for the part where we've agreed to play. These are more than costumes, but they are costumes as well. There are police officers who wear uniforms, and they're different and distinct from firefighters who wear uniforms. And within the police, there are state police uniforms and city police uniforms and county police uniforms, and it goes on. Uh, often they indicate social status, and if you go to a hospital, there is a difference between the nurse and the nurse practitioner and the uh, attendant and the doctor, and you can often tell that by what they're wearing. If you see me in a pinstripe suit and a silk tie, you can be pretty certain that I'm not going to be washing windows on a skyscraper that day. And then decorum, teamwork, we may call it, or synergy, or cooperation, contributing to the common good. Outward Bound is a great program that fosters this. Teamwork, decorum. Now, are you with me so far? Have you got all that? Does it make sense? Are we okay? Let's shift gears again and see how this applies to us. I, there are a thousand qualifications and explanations I should have made, but you'd be grateful that I didn't take the time to do that. Overall, isn't this an exciting hypothesis? The hypothesis is that everything in culture originates in play as an expression of our innate playfulness. It is a confirmation of Shakespeare's famous dictum that all the world is a stage and we're merely players upon it. And I want to take you now back to ancient Greece. The Greeks came up with a concept called paideia, a fundamental term for anyone who studies classical Greek civilization. The word itself was first given a prominence by 5th century BCE philosopher Isocrates. And paideia means culture. It means the pursuit of excellence collectively. Paideia, Greek culture, the Hellene longing for the perfection of truth, beauty, goodness. Now, we have lots of arguments today about what should be considered excellent, but so did the Greeks. Nevertheless, it means that the Greeks understood that their civilization was an aspirational civilization. It aspired to uh, to that which was most excellent. At the center of the culture was an aspiration to achieve the most excellent understanding and expression of goodness, truth, and beauty. For complete transparency, what I'm about to say is my own hypothesis rather than the consensus of any Hellenic, Hellenic scholars. In fact, I've argued with them unsuccessfully. But the word playful child is paideon, as opposed to technon in classical Greek. Technon was the child of one's own bearing, whereas paideon was more likely to be a young student or scholar or playful child. What if culture, paideia, is, is rooted in the word paideon, or they are from the same root, and it is one's aspirations, even one's play? Why did Plato say that life must be lived as play? Unless, perhaps, he meant it. How about let's, let's leave that now for a moment and go over to India. There was a certain Hindu teacher who said that all of creation is an expression of playfulness, which he called Layla, play. Do you like my Hindu 
teacher there I put up on the screen. When I walk in the woods or in the fields or even in downtown Sarasota, I see how this might very well be true. The aim of spirituality is to make all life play, he said. But this seemed frivolous to a puritanical visitor. Is there no room for work, they said. Of course there's room for work, he said. But work must become spiritual, or work becomes spiritual, only when it is transformed by play. Are you with me? The psalmist famously asked, what is humanity that God is mindful of us? What indeed are we? And by the way, I, I've been told that in Latin, homo is gender neutral, can mean both man and woman, or both. And so when we talk about these, it's good to keep that in mind. Until the Enlightenment, the answer generally was, what is humanity? Humanity is homo adorans, the being who adores, the being who worships, the being who lives in the presence of mystery. That is what it means to be human. Carl Linnaeus, in the mid-18th century, in his magnum opus, giving us the entire uh, classification of, human, of, of living species, exalted instead and invented and exalted the title Homo sapiens. Man, you know the part, right? The wise. Man, the wise. You look at our world today, and think, would he still pick that? Or would he have perhaps a different name? Marx came along, understandably questioned this de designation, and came up with another one. Homo faber, man the maker, man the creator. Uh, and that is still gaining traction today. Most recently, no less than Uberto Eco has embraced it. But there is another that might encompass all three of these, and that is Homo Ludens. As we look back through the lens of history, what do we see? Who are we? As we look forward to the world we are creating, what do we see? Whom shall we be? Homo Ludens. Amen. One thousand and twenty four, the Spirit says, do. You gotta do when the Spirit says, do. You gotta do when the Spirit says, do. When the Spirit says, do, you gotta do, oh Lord. You gotta do when the Spirit says, do. Spirit says do, 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 Spirit says do. You gotta dance, you gotta dance when the Spirit says dance. You gotta dance when the Spirit says dance. When the Spirit says dance, you gotta dance, oh Lord. You gotta dance when the Spirit says dance. Spirit says dance, 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 Spirit says dance. You gotta laugh, you gotta laugh when the Spirit says laugh. You gotta laugh when the Spirit says laugh. When the Spirit says laugh, you gotta laugh, oh Lord. You gotta laugh when the Spirit says laugh. Spirit says laugh, 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 Spirit says laugh. 
got to do, you got to do when the Spirit says do. You got to do when the Spirit says do. When the Spirit says do, you got to do, oh Lord, you got to do when the Spirit says do. Spirit says do, 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 Spirit says do. Great. Go from this place and leave behind the do your work in 4-4 four, four time and the what do you expect waltz. Learn new steps and new dances and prepare for the unexpected.